For those who don't know me, some of my passions, I like to read, I like to study, I'm one of those weirdos. I like ultimate frisbee, especially if I'm winning. Um, and most of all, those who know me can tell you, I love to run. Any other runners here? Any other? Yes, running is fantastic. If you have never run before, I promise you, it is a great feeling. The wind in your face, the feeling of uh, accomplishment as you crawl over the finish line. It's just a fantastic, fantastic sport. One of my fondest and funniest running memories involves a half marathon. So my mother, who loves us, um, signed us up for a Disney World half marathon, which sounds amazing. And when I say us, I mean my father, my brother, and I. However, what she did not tell us was that it was the princess half marathon. <laughs> and she claims to this day that she called Disney and an employee who I don't know if they were new or lying to her, told her that it's 50% men, 50% women, totally right. I'm pretty sure, and I have pictures to prove it, we were the only single guys in that race. I mean, <laughs> we were it. It was us and a bunch of dads with their daughters running this half marathon, right? It was, but it was phenomenal. It was phenomenal. It was an amazing, amazing time because we got to get to the parks early in the morning. We ran through when they were totally empty uh, and we finished. We finished. Now, most of you will not run the Disney Princess Half Marathon. <laughs> Many of you don't even want to run the Disney Half Marathon. However, I'm here to tell you this morning that you are currently running a much more important race. You are currently running the race of life. And this is not a race that you chose. This is a race you were born into. The question is not, are you going to run this race? The question is, how will you run this race? Will you run this race well? Looking back on a life spent pursuing God and loving his people. Or will you get to the end of this race? And as you crawl across the finish line, will you look back full of regrets and disappointments? How do we run the race of life well? That's what today's passage is about. Today's passage is about this most important of races, your life. And for those of you taking notes mentally or on paper, in chapter 12, the author of Hebrews is going to give us four guidelines for running well. He's going to tell us to listen, to lighten, to lean, and to look. But first, some context. So if you would turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews 12, that's where we'll be today. Now, for those of you who haven't been to seminary, Hebrews 12 comes after Hebrews 11. <laughs> I know that's a shock. And in chapter 11, the author walks through the lives of many famous saints. It's commonly called the Hall of Faith. Abraham, Moses, Abel, Gideon, they all make appearances in this hall of faith as he points out how their faith in God and God's faithfulness carried them through life and how God did amazing things through each of these Old Testament saints. But then chapter 12 gets a little uncomfortable because in chapter 12, the author turns from the Old Testament saints to you and to me. He turns the spotlight on us, and he asks, how does this great testimony of faith change the way we walk today? Because I can tell you that all of the Old Testament saints, all the Bible stories you heard in Sunday school, all those people have finished the race. They're done. And they ran it well. But you are still on the race. And so how are you to run the race well? Let's find out together. As I mentioned, please turn to Hebrews 12, 1, and we'll be going 12, 1 through 3. It will be on the screen as well. Let's read together. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. 
For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The author of Hebrews is talking about this great race, the race of life. And first, he reminds us to listen, to listen to the testimony of God's people. You'll see the first thing he talks about coming out of chapter 11 is this cloud of witnesses. Now, the cloud here refers to a large group of people. It's a metaphor for a ton of people. Coming out of the hall of faith, the cloud of people he's referring to are the Old Testament saints, the people of God who walked before you, who followed God. Now, the idea of witnesses here, and this blew my mind, is not spectators, but witnesses in a courtroom. Witnesses in a courtroom do not sit passively and watch, cheering you on on your race. They testify to what they have seen and heard. These people in the Old Testament that the author of Hebrews walked through, Abraham, Moses, are not just watching our run to see if we're going to make it, but instead their lives are actively testifying to the faithfulness of God and the possibility of success. For an illustration, I went through a bit of a dog sitting spree last year, and if I was watching a particularly large or scary dog, like a chihuahua, they terrify me, I wanted to talk to people who had watched that dog before to find out if it was possible or even desirable to dog sit this dog. And as I talked to the previous sitters, they assured me, they testified to the friendliness of the dog and the wonderful relationship that can be formed. Similarly, these witnesses that the author refers to here, the Old Testament saints, testify to the desirability of a life of faith and the fact that God will see it through. These people have run the race before you, the people described in the words of these scriptures. Look at their lives, listen to them, see where they fell, see where they stumbled and marvel at what God accomplished in their lives anyway. Secondly, he calls us to lighten the load. He tells us to lay aside every encumbrance, which just means weight, and the sin, which so easily entangles. In the first century, uh, Greek runners would enter the stadium wearing long, colorful, flowing robes, a tradition I hope we bring back someday. <laughs> now, if they had tried to run in these robes, they would have fallen. They would, that would have been stupid. The robes would have entangled them. I mean, I can't even run in jeans, much less robes, right? So instead, they would take off these robes, in order to run the race as well as they could. I promise you, if you've never run before, go outside in the parking lot after service and try running. You do not want to be weighed down by anything. You don't want to carry any weight. You only want to have the bare essentials in order to run. Similarly, the author of Hebrews calls us to lighten our load of anything that would stop us from spiritually running well. He calls us to strip off anything, anything at all, that stops us from running after God with all of our heart, all of our mind, and all of our soul. Weight here refers to anything that trips us up, distracts us, or entangles us as we seek to run after God. The Greek word here is the idea of constriction. The idea of trying to run with something tightening around you. That's what sin does in our life. It slows us down, it entangles us, and it keeps us from running effectively. We must shed anything, anything at all, that would hold us back from running after God. And that includes every type of sin. What's entangling you this morning? Is it money, popularity, power, comfort, lust, certain people or places, certain things, whatever it is, I beg of you, cast it off, cut it out of your life. You don't need it. You don't need any additional weight as we seek to run the race that God has set before us. Ask God this week to show you, and by the way, I testify to the fact that if you ask him, he will, and it's painful. So be careful what you ask. Ask him to show you what's constricting you 
Ask him to show you what's entangling you and slowing you down. This leads us to the main command of this passage, running the race. The author of Hebrews calls us to lean into the race, to run the race with endurance. So simple, but so hard. But simple. (laughs) Basically, if the Christian life can be viewed like a race, keep running it well. Don't stop, don't flag, don't become distracted, but run well, enduring suffering, hardship, and whatever it takes to keep on going. Endurance is actually the prominent word in the Greek text. It's the first word. We are meant to run the, run of the race of life with perseverance, not speed. Life is more like a half marathon than a sprint or a full marathon. Life also, like running, involves suffering. When you stop and think about it, and I'm not talking about even just grand ideas of suffering. I know many of you have suffered many things that I can't imagine. But you think about it, even on the small scale, everything you've done in your life that's worth doing has involved some form of suffering. Early mornings, late nights, uncomfortable conversations. I recently proposed, <laughs> and, which was phenomenal. But I promise you, if there are any guys who slept through the night before you proposed... <laughs> God bless you, because I didn't. (laughs) Running through my head what I was going to say, how this moment was going to be perfect. That involved discipline. It took effort. Not to propose, but to think about it. (laughs) (laughs) Many of you went through boot camp. I know. And as you went through that, you suffered. You endured, but you did it with a goal, a clear goal of what you wanted to do with your life. I encourage you, I challenge you, take that discipline that you've applied to all night video game sessions, that you've applied to late nights with friends, that you've applied to boot camp, that you've applied to getting your first job, whatever it is, take that endurance and put all of it towards running after God. (laughs) Apply the same discipline because he's worth it so much more than all those other things. The Christian walk involves suffering. You'll have to sacrifice time, money. You might have to give up your right to revenge or pleasure or comfort or popularity. But it's so worth it. He's so worth it. How do we know it's worth it? How do we gain the strength, the perspective, and the encouragement we need to keep running well? We do it by fixing our eyes on Jesus. Which brings us to the author's next command. Look at Jesus. He says here, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. When running, we all need to fix our minds on something. For me, as I was running that half marathon, I was determined, I had set the goal to run the whole marathon without stopping. I did not want to stop. I could run as slow as I wanted, but I would not stop running until I crossed that Mickey Mouse finish line. (laughs) I was determined to do it. And so I ran with my eyes fixed on that goal, counting down the miles. My eyes were fixed on that finish line and that sense of achievement that only comes when you accomplish something you set out to do. For the author of Hebrews, Jesus is that worthy object of our focus. The Greek words used here for fixing our eyes on Jesus are very similar to the words used in chapter 11 to refer to Moses. In chapter 11, it talks about how Moses had his eyes fixed on God and gave up the riches of a life spent in Pharaoh's palace, all the pleasures and all the power that came with that in order to pursue God and run the race well. Similarly, we must keep our focus on Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith, if we are going to run well. Take your mind off Jesus, and you risk losing focus. William Lane, who wrote a commentary on this book, says this, and I love this image. He says, Jesus is positioned at the finish line. Like a runner, the Christian must intently focus on the goal of Jesus. That's an image to carry you through your day. 
Jesus standing at the finish line, beckoning you, saying, come on, child, finish well, run well. What does it mean that Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith? Well, there's so much nuance in those two words. But in one sense, what it means is that Jesus is the source of our faith, giving us salvation and security through his death and resurrection. He guarantees the perfection of our faith by promising to come back and make us perfect like him. That's the gospel. In another sense, and this also fits these Greek words, Jesus is also the champion of our faith in that he showed us what a life perfectly submitted to God looks like. Jesus ran the race perfectly. He is the completer of our faith since he finished and was exalted to be with God. The author turns our attention to this wonderful accomplishment, pointing out that Jesus endured the cross and was exalted. Jesus ran the race and did it successfully. His successful mission has enabled our success eternally. He died a horrifically shameful death on a cross, side by side with criminals. But because he endured, he was glorified to the right hand of God, raising from the dead, beating the powers of Rome, taking away our sin, and now sits at the right hand of God forevermore. Jesus wins. He won the race, and his victory enables you to win the race. His victory enables our victory alongside him. We can win the race too, by his grace and strength. The author closes by reminding us to think about his example. He says here, consider his example, consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The idea of considering is not to think once about something, to just wake up in the middle of the night and go, oh, Jesus is cool, and go back to sleep. It's actually a mathematical term. It means to reckon, to count up, to add, to compare. It comes from commerce. The idea is that we think deeply about Jesus, just as deeply as you think about your mortgage or your finances. <laughs> More so. Think deeply about him. Consider him. Uh, consider his example. Compare him. Understand him so that his experience will have a deep effect on your day-to-day -day life. You should think so intently about the example of Jesus that as you walk out of here Sunday morning, you can't help but think about him every time, every interaction, every moment you have this week. We should look to the example of Jesus so that we do not lose heart when things get hard and keeping our eyes fixed on him. Do you take the time in the rigmarole of your busy life to reflect on Jesus, to consider his example? Do you read this to know enough what his example is? Do you know the Jesus I'm talking about? At the beginning of my time here, Pastor Michael, who has mentored me for four years, so if you have complaints about this sermon, direct it to michael at burkcommunity.com. <laughs> Pastor Michael once told me about a period of time he was working at the Pentagon. While slugging into the Pentagon, and he was busy, he was leaving early in the morning, had no time, so while slugging into the Pentagon, he started an interesting habit. He started reading through the Gospel of Matthew, and he liked it so much, he read through the Gospel of Mark, <laughs> and the Gospel of Luke, and the Gospel of John. And he liked that so much, he went back to the beginning and read through them again. And quickly, it became part of his liturgy, part of his routine every single morning, slugging into the Pentagon for only a few minutes to read through the Gospels, to study intently, to consider the example of Christ. And over time, he found that by looking at how Jesus lived, by understanding his Savior, by seeing his example, he started to live more like Jesus. Because how can you spend any time with a person like Jesus without becoming more like him? Jesus showed Pastor Michael how to run the race well. And he will show you too. Not only will he show you, he'll give you the grace and strength to actually do it. And he'll pick you up when you fall down and keep you going. 
Fix your eyes on him. Don't get distracted. All right, conclusion, test time. You are on the racetrack of life. For some of you, it's about to speed up. For others, it might slow down. Regardless, I encourage you to listen to the testimony of the saints. Listen to the testimony of God's people. Read this. Understand it. See where they fell. And see the grace of God in their life anyway. Lighten your load of any sin or excess weight. There are enough things weighing you down without you adding to it. <laughs> Lighten your load. Pray about it. Find people around you to help you. That's what the church is for. Lean into the race. Run with endurance. It's worth it. Remind yourself of all the things you've done that were on such a lower scale than following Jesus that you put so much into and apply that same discipline to seeking after him. Run well with endurance. And finally, look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. Let's pray. God, you're gracious. Lord, you're so good. As I look at the example of people like Abraham and Moses and Gideon and Jephthah and Abel, Lord, I see their imperfections just like me, but I see how you came alongside them every step of the race, how you picked them back up, and how, Lord, with their eyes fixed on you, they were able to run well. Father, I pray for every single person here, Lord, that this week they would run well. Lord, that today they would run well, that this minute they would run well. Lord, fix their eyes on you. If there's anyone here who doesn't know you, who doesn't know who I'm talking about, Lord, I pray they'd come to know you today. That, Lord, it would bother them until they come to know you. I pray, Lord, that we would listen to your people, that we would lighten the load. God, show us our sin and show us your great grace to take it away. Lord, we're so foolish, turning aside for the dandelion of sin on the path. Lord, I pray that you would show us how much more worth it you are and help us to let go of these stupid weights. Father, I pray that we would run with endurance, Lord, especially for these high school seniors. Lord, as they head off to whatever you have in store for them, I pray that they would run it with endurance. That, Lord, even as they go through hard times, they would remember how worth it you are and how much less the world has to offer them. And Father, I pray that we would look to you. Jesus, show us who you are. Lord, be present with us. Turn our eyes to you. Help us to look to you. You are good, and we love you. In Christ's precious name I pray. Amen.